welcome to JW Forwardcast, the show that helps former Jehovah's Witnesses and other former members of high control groups and religions rebuild their lives and become the people they were always supposed to be. So welcome to our second episode uh, discussing the film Apostasy. So if you've not seen our previous episode, episode four, I'd strongly recommend you uh, go back and listen to that first because that's where Alice Cheshire, who's a former Jehovah's Witness and now a life coach, uh, and myself, also a former Jehovah's Witness and now a disembodied voice talking to you on the internet, that's where we um, sit down and discuss the general themes of apostasy, um, which is a new film uh, which has been released by director and writer Daniel Cocatilo, who himself is a former Jehovah's Witness. Um, In the previous uh, episode, we talk about the general themes of the film and how the level of accuracy measures up to our own experiences of being a Jehovah's Witness. Um, And we also talk about some of the, the things we can talk about without spoiling the plot. Um, So if you haven't listened to that one, probably best to go back and listen to it first to kind of catch the first half of the discussion. In this half of the discussion, myself and Alice Cheshire jump into spoilers. Uh, There are no holds barred. There are no details which are not uh, not discussed. So if you haven't seen the film yet, I strongly urge you to go out and watch the film first because a lot of the power and the impact uh, in this film uh, comes when events happen that you may not see coming, or maybe if you see them coming, you don't see them coming in the way that they happen. Um, and just watching kind of the unfolding um, story of uh, Luisa and Alex and Ivana is very, very gripping. So obviously, if you want to if you want to keep listening and you haven't seen the film, that's fair enough. But uh, be prepared, we are going to spoil uh, probably most of the major plot details and plot revelations. So grab your popcorn, settle back. And listen to myself and Alice Cheshire discuss the in-depth plot details of the new film Apostasy by writer-director Daniel Cocotilo. So the bit right at the end where Sigourney Weaver climbs into that uh, yellow power loader thing and fights a giant Tony Morris in the uh, the belly of that starship before firing Tony Morris out into space. I didn't see that coming. I thought that was a really was, compelling ending. Yeah, I was, really, I was really surprised at that. You know, I, I thought with the whole film being quite understated and then all of a sudden it goes full on action movie right at the end. I mean, who'd have thunk it? Uh, it's incredible. It really was, you know. <laughs> apparently, apparently apostasy is part of the, the Marvel Universe. Um, you know, Robert Downey Jr. popping up at the end in the Iron Man suit. I was I'm not expecting. Um, (laughs) no so here we are so this is um we're now going to be discussing the spoilers for apostasy and we're going to break these down into like events and themes and i think it's probably quite interesting if we start from early on um one of the things i thought was very very i mean for me because i know the way that narratives are constructed and if you if you mention something in the first act it's going to come back in the third and obviously one of the big events here is the fact that Alex, Alex refuses a blood transfusion and dies. Yeah. Um, and the way we start this journey is we start with her um, in a doctor's office making a decision as to whether or not she'd accept blood because the doctor's telling her that she has anemia and that potentially this could, you know, she was saved with the blood transfusion when she was a little girl. And the, but if, you know, if this, if this problem comes back, they may need to transfuse her again. And um, you have that confrontation slightly between Ivana, Ivana the mother, and the doctor. Um, the way Ivana reacted to the concerns of, of the doctor when she kind of dismisses the medical information with, well, that's just your opinion, mm. um, I found kind of cut quite close to home because I remember hearing that kind of stuff and either, even saying it myself. What did you think of the way they introduced the blood theme in this particular film? Well, as with everything else in the film, it was understated. You yeah. know, it, it was presented. It was presented in such a way that you know, lots of people when when they're talking about the you know the blood stuff, lots of ex JWs and uh, sorry, lots of lots of non JWs, you know, mm. people from the outside who haven't lived in it. And um, lots of people say, yeah, but you you wouldn't really though, would you? You know, when when ex JWs say that their parents would have let them die. Yeah. Rather than accept a blood transfusion. The reaction is always, yeah, but they wouldn't really, would they? And what I really liked about this um, is that there was no kind of sensationalism around it. There was no kind mm. of, you know, you must not have a blood transfusion. Oh, 
shock, horror. It was just that's mm. the way that it is. And for Ivana and Alex, you know, there, there was there was no sensationalism around it. It wasn't some great dramatic moment where Alex was raising her fist to the skies and saying, I would rather die than, you know, blah, blah, blah. Mm. It was just muted. This is how it is. Um, like you say, Ivana makes that comment of that's just your opinion to a, a medical professional. Mm. What I thought was also interesting about this was that initially it's Alex in the doctor's office. Mm. Um, and we also know from events in the film that Alex has just turned 18. So mm. we know that she's an adult. Um, she's, it's just her in the doctor's office. Um, looking scared, looking uh, not, not doubtful, but, but doubtful of her own ability to, to kind of... Um, uh, to put across what she's trying to say. Yeah. And then the doctor is sort of saying to her, you know, we can do it so that nobody would know. I wouldn't tell your mum. And then Ivana, as the mum, comes in and makes the stand on behalf of Alex. And it's an interesting point that that there isn't this... It, it, a lot of JW parents continue this kind of control over their children, even when they are legally able to make their own decisions. Mm you know, they still feel this need to kind of swoop in and, and you know, stand up for, 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 their, for their children's rights. But also it's almost like, it's almost like she was speaking for herself rather mm. than thinking about Alex. Um, you know, it was as a whole, this is our family. This is what our mm. family do. And our family will not accept blood transfusions. Um, no. And then, like you say, it, it sort of comes back then to bite later on in the film. Um, and I... When, I yeah, events yeah. transpire. I mean, then there's two things I thought were very, I really appreciated about the way they handle it. One, you don't actually see, there's no like rushing through hospitals and arguing with surgeons yeah. over last minute transfusions. The actual event is, you don't see it, it's off screen. Uh, Alex gets ill at a party and then we cut to a shot of Ivana walking out, Ivana, sorry, walking out of the hospital. And it's, you don't really realize what's happened until no. about five minutes later when people are having discussions and then they cut to the funeral. Um, and I thought that again, that was this, this film is not looking for sensation. It's not looking to sensationalize it. Um, I thought that was a very, I thought that was, a, I really appreciated that move because by Daniel, because he wasn't going for the low hanging fruit, the cheap emotional response. He was going for something a lot more subtle. Um, the thing, other thing I thought was really interesting is it's, it's made fairly clear that it really is Alex's choice at the end to refuse blood. Yeah. And I'm, I was very grateful. They didn't show it like the evil elders and Ivana were forcing it on her. It's clear that Alex has been indoctrinated so much so, because you see her looking through that, that infamous magazine article of the youths who died faithful. Mm. Um, and you can hear, because one, the, the, one of the narrative um, tools they use is you get to hear Alex's prayers when she's talking to Jehovah, and she's very clearly buying into this indoctrination. And I think this was, it was a lot more powerful to have Alex willingly choose to refuse blood and then lose her life because it yeah. shows how dangerous and powerful indoctrination is. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that was, again, this, this is because it would have been far easier to make it all dramatic and having Alex, Alex not sure, but having the elders force it on her, but that wouldn't have been accurate. And there are a lot of Jehovah's witnesses and a lot of Jehovah's witness minors who choose of their own, you know, because they are indoctrinated and surrounded by all this kind of peer pressure reinforcement um, to refuse blood of their own accord. And that's yeah. a lot more frightening and it's a lot more powerful and a lot more tragic. And I think what was really interesting is ex in, in informing that choice, we find out that when she was a baby, she did have a blood transfusion forced on her. Mm. And that you know, it's mentioned at one point that the elders and, and her mother tried to stop it and it was forced on her by the hospital. And she carries that guilt with her. Um, yeah. She feels this guilt that, that, you know, she's somehow lesser, she's somehow unclean, making her even more determined that should that situation arise again, she would, um, uh, you know, she would stand firm. And, and, and as I say, with her, you never get the idea that she has a doubt about what she would do. Mm. It's almost like she's, she's, she's having a doubt about how she expresses it and how she informs and having that courage to, you know, to stand up and, and, and speak out against, you know, the, the doctor at the beginning. Mm. Um, but all the way through, you, you, never, you never have any kind of feeling that she doesn't mm. believe that that's the right course of action to take, mm. um, which is even more heartbreaking for this young, uh, beautiful 18-year-old girl. And like you say, it shows that level of indoctrination. And this is, again, one of those points where um, it could have been sensationalised, mm. and yet people watching this film who haven't been JWs and who have perhaps had that 
oh, but you wouldn't really refuse a blood transfusion. And it just mm. demonstrates, yeah, absolutely, this happens. Yeah. I mean, Mo- Molly Wright is the actor who portrays Alex, and she is, she is hauntingly good in the way mm. she... It's a very understated, very subtle performance, and it's it, it. But she can plays she conveys completely that conviction that this is what she wants to do, and she also she's constantly worried that she won't get through Armageddon. She has a discussion with Ivana about who will and who won't get through, and it's a recurring theme that Alex is still worried that she won't be good enough. That maybe mm. she's got to do that that extra. She's got to do a little bit extra to atone for the blood transfusion that she feels unclean for. Um, and again, that's the, these are little subtle notes, but these are all things that add up to a situation where a person would willingly refuse life-saving treatment of their own accord um, because they honestly believe it's the morally right thing to do. And this is why cult indoctrination is scary because it's not necessarily that it's, it's arm-locking you into doing something you don't want to do, although it can do that. It can make you smilingly put the gun to your own temple and pull the trigger in the right circumstances. Uh, and that's yeah. why it's it's quite terrifying. And I think, like you say, what, what's really interesting about the way that it's portrayed in the narrative is that when you see Ivana walk out of the hospital, there's a growing sense of dread. Mm. I, I had this growing sense of dread and my internal monologue was essentially, no, 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 please, no. Mm. And for a few minutes, like you say, you're not entirely sure of what's happened because we then see Ivana going to work and, and having this, yeah. this kind of, and, and I think something that we, we may come on to talk about in a minute is Ivana and, and um, the, the reactions and, and how she is portrayed yeah. throughout the film. But it's only then when you then see this conversation taking place between her and an elder mm. um, about the, uh, the, um, the funeral. And yeah. then you see the funeral and the, and the leaflet, you know, in memory of. And that was the moment actually when, I mean, I, I'd been on the verge of tears before that point. But that was the moment when I was actually sobbing. And I, and I think I cried for the most of the rest of the film from that point. So one of the things I wanted to talk about, and this brings on to nicely, is the portrayal um, by Siobhan Finneran um, of Ivana. Um, and I think that was a wonderful piece of acting because it demonstrates so many JWs, they're kind of locked down and controlled and they don't under certain circumstances. And for most of the um, the film, she's quite a controlled, almost, she isn't cold, but she seems to be unresponsive to a lot of what's happening. She's not necessarily blank, but you can tell in her face, she, uh, she does a lot with her eyes and the way that she's, the way that she, the way that the camera kind of moves around her. And she does a lot of subtle acting, but she's not kind of this big religious fanatic shouty ranting about what god wants person which again would have been i think that would have been the choice a less a lesser director would have made that choice but she's very just kind of subtle and doesn't respond to very much um and there's one occasion which is um well there's actually two one is where we see her break down after alex dies when she's underlining the watchtower and then she just starts ripping it to pieces with the pen and just starts weeping openly um and the other is when right at the end of the film where she finally, I, the implication is she sees her granddaughter for the first time and she picks yeah. the baby up and she's suddenly smiling and grinning and happy. And she's talking to the baby and she's all, you know, for that one moment, you feel like you see that's the real Ivana. That's the Ivana that doesn't have her kind of JW personality locked in and, and doing what she has to do. And that that's the real person. That's who she wants to be. She wants to be the person who like hugs her grandchild and, you know, helps her daughter through her pregnancy. And we, we do see there's a, there's, um, there is some friction between Ivana. She wants to help her daughter who is alone and will come on to shunning later. Um, and the elders keep telling her to back off. And even though Ivana wants to do what she's told, she's clearly struggling with it. Mm. Um, and it, it struck me there are so many ways that so many JWs, there's the person they really are underneath, but then there's the person the cult requires them to be. Um, and I, it just struck me that in that moment, it, and it was such a great choice, when she picks the baby up, suddenly she comes alive. And it's like for that moment, we see who she'd be if she wasn't a Jehovah's Witness. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, it, it was a fantastic portrayal by her. I mean, it was, it's one of the best pieces of acting that I have seen for a mm. long time. And like you say, throughout the film, there, there are moments of tenderness. Um, yeah. You know, at one point um, they're out walking and she she turns to one of her daughters and, and pulls their coat together and says, you know, wrap up warm. You know, yeah. you see these moments of tenderness through the film. Um, and then, like you say, that that moment, the moment when she breaks down is just, I mean, it's it's 
heartbreaking, absolutely mm. heartbreaking. I'm actually feeling a bit, you know, I, I, I can feel myself choking up again mm. thinking about it. And then, like you say, right at the end of the film, you see this flash, this moment of it's the only time she actually smiles, properly smiles in the entire mm. film. Even when they go to the JW party and they're around friends and they're socializing, you know, she's clearly enjoying herself. She's clearly having a good time. But that, that moment when she picks up her granddaughter is the only time you see this broad smile and, and the real person that she really is. Um, and then obviously shortly after that, there's a moment of madness that overtakes mm. her where because obviously and you, you can see it's almost like the culmination of everything that's happened through the film and all of the, the, you know, she's been holding all of her emotions in for so long throughout the film that she has a moment of madness where she effectively tries to steal the baby from mm. um, her daughter, Louisa, and tries to take the baby. And you, you can see she's not thinking clearly because, you know, she doesn't have a car seat or anything like that. She just goes and puts the baby in the back seat, And it's just a, you know, it's, it's, it's a flash of, 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 of madness. And then, you know, she doesn't fight. Louisa comes and takes the baby back yeah. and everything's okay. But she's saying, I'll save her. I'll save yeah. her. I'll take her to the Kingdom Hall and I'll save her. And I just thought that that kind of, um, that emotional journey that she goes on throughout the film that culminates in that utter moment of desperation yeah. you know she's she's lost one daughter to death she's lost another daughter to shunning and the only way she can see to to somehow you know make some kind of sense out of all of this is to then try and and save her granddaughter as she mm. puts it and just just watching that portrayal was and then ultimately what happens at the end is that the final moment of the scene is you see her standing there alone yeah. You see her on her own with the car. And that ties into something that Daniel said in one of the interviews when he was talking about JWs and shunning. And he says, you know, they make this choice and they go along with the shunning and they shun these people, but ultimately they end up alone. Yeah. And that was a true demonstration of that because through the choices that she had made and that she had raised her daughters to make, she was the one that ended up alone. And, and you know, and this, you, you, you don't judge this character at all. You cannot mm. judge her all you can feel is just utterly devastated for her. And I, I think it's, I think in, in many ways, the film is uh, Ivana's story as much as that of Alex or Louisa, um, because it, for me, it's a demonstration again of how the organization and its teachings twist love and make people do, make people do damaging things out of a misguided idea of love. Because in each case, Ivana is acting in what she thinks is the best interest of everyone. When she, when she, you know, indoctrinates Alex to refuse blood, she's doing it because she honestly thinks she's acting in Alex's best interest because of the indoctrination that the Watchtower Society puts on her. When she shuns Louisa and essentially loses Louisa, the relationship with her, she's doing it because she thinks it's in the best interest of Louisa to bring her back to the meetings because if she doesn't, Louisa's going to be destroyed at Armageddon. And then ultimately when she snaps and tries to, you know, effectively steal her, her grandchild from, from Louisa, again, which is another, you know, it's a, it's a dreadful thing to do, but she's doing it because she loves her grandchild and she thinks that it's the only way to stop her grandchild being destroyed. And ultimately, you can trace, this is, this is the tragic thing, that Ivana's, none of this has to happen. And the only reason it's happening is because Ivana has been indoctrinated and victimized by the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. And it shows the impact that, um, you know, these kind of, that religious doctrine can have on somebody when it's combined into this fundamentalist mindset um, and that final shot where she's standing there alone on, on a cart. And if you were just walking past, you wouldn't know. And it struck me. That's one thing you always got to keep in mind. When you see JW standing there on carts, you don't know what they're dealing with. They could be somebody who has, you know, experienced the kind of the loss and the trauma that Ivana has, but they're still clinging to that religion because it's all, you know, for Ivana, it's the only hope she has left of seeing Alex in her mind. And she still wants to somehow save her grandchild. So, Again, this and it comes back to what I said. This is a film that cares deeply for its JW characters, and it's it really is asking you to be to be kind and to be to be um, thoughtful and empathetic towards Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, it's it's the furthest the furthest thing you could possibly get from a film that was like asking you to like hate or be angry against Jehovah's Witnesses. It's a film that, if anything, you want to go up to all the JWs on a cart and just give them a big hug, even if they don't know what it's for. Um, which I thought was an incredib incredibly powerful final shot for the movie to have. So one of the other big themes which gets touched on is uh, shunning. And we see shunning come into the film when Louisa is uh, the daughter who's gone off to college um, and she's actually clearly 
I, I like the way they portray Louisa as clearly at the start being interested in the religion and believing it, but gradually drifting away. And you, you do get little hints that she's maybe gone online and done a little bit of research because she mentions yeah. things that a Jehovah's Witness wouldn't know. But I also appreciate the fact that Louisa at no, at no point you know, steps up and gives a 10-minute sermon on the inc- inaccuracies of this, that, and the other, because you wouldn't, a Jehovah's Witness wouldn't do that, um, you, especially one who was fading. I think there was, a, there was a nice, or maybe was unsure, there was just a nice way that they just wove it subtly into the background so you could tell she'd probably been on JW Facts. Mm. Um, and she gets pregnant. And again, that moment where she hands the ultrasound to Ivana, so there's one of two ways someone can react when they're told they're going to be a grandparent. And the natural way is not the way Ivana reacts. She reacts with kind of horror and you must bring him to the meetings and you must marry him. And it's the only way to make it right. Um, and of course, that starts um, a whole chain reaction of events that ends up with Louisa being disfellowshipped, pregnant, shunned, cut off from everybody, alone in a flat um, which is absolutely heartbreaking. Um, now, the reason I bring this up is apparently Daniel said in the Q&A that one of the things that inspired this film is he heard an audio recording of a woman in a very similar situation trying to get reinstated with the elders. And you see, you see apparently that inspired a, a reinstatement hearing that we see with Louisa and the various elders, where they're, they're basically just, they're not interested. You know, they, they keep saying, we're not, we don't think you're fully repentant. And she's pleading them with, what do I have to do? And yeah. uh, and they're, they're it's, the, kind of, it's the hoop jumping. It's the yes. hoop jumping. And this is, and this is, I think, you know, this kind of ties in with some of the stuff that we were talking before we went, you know, full spoiler. The the way that the elders are, are reacting to her, which is essentially she's sort of pleading with, you know, they're they're saying to her, you know, what have you what have you done to demonstrate your repentance? And she's, you know, she's trying to explain what she's been doing. And it, it's they're they're trying to make her jump through hoops. And yeah. at one point she says to her mother, you know, the elders have got it in for me. Yes. And it just goes to show the power that those three elders, one of whom is Stephen, the younger mm. elder, who, as you say, he's genuinely trying to help. You know, she she runs out of the, um, at one point, you know, she screams to them, you're not the policeman mm. of my life. This is this is stupid. And she leaves. And Stephen follows her out to the car and tries to persuade her, come back in, you know, we're, we're going to make mm. everything okay. Um, but but the, those those elders have complete power and authority over whether or not they think, in their opinion, yeah. Someone is truly repentant, and it, it just goes to show. And you, you know that, that what we were saying about the the elder elders, the the you know the older ones, yeah. um, who, who clearly were only looking at it from the point of view of do we feel that this person has jumped through enough hoops mm. that we can deem that that we can allow them back into the congregation? It was a bureaucratic then, exercise. Yeah, what they're not looking at, and they've got this 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 mother and sister of Louisa standing in front of them pleading and, and 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 trying to you know get the relationship back with their family member and there's no empathy there whatsoever because they can't see it and they don't see it from that point of view all mm. they can think about is enforcing the rules and regulations and it's almost like they feel that if they were to allow her back in when she's not fully repentant that would be a black mark against them so they make yeah. her do more rather than you know rather than accepting what she's saying um and 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 you know you add into the fact that by this point she's what seven or eight months pregnant mm. she's on her own she's living on her own her mother Ivana says many many times or, you know quite a few times can I start helping her with bits you know she's on her own can I take her some food can I do this and they, they also hint as well that the, the, that she's not physically that healthy they sort of say the midwife says the baby hasn't hasn't grown quite as much as they are expecting so it's clear that the, the health of Louisa and the health of the baby she needs help at this point mm. yeah um, and, you know, then the, the, the guilt tripping comes in because when Ivana is talking to the elders about, you know, what's taking so long, why has she not been reinstated yet? They then turn it around and, and make a big deal out of the fact that Ivana cleaned her fridge for her. Mm. You know, she's she's seven months pregnant. She's got a massive bump out in front of her. Um, how on earth can she, you know, bend down and clean a fridge? So her mother does something that any mother would do in that situation. And yet the elders cite that as an example of one of the reasons why she's not making progress towards reinstatement. Yeah. And it, it, it kind of, it, it struck me ultimately the cruelty of shunning. One of the, the great reviews I saw was, um, was uh, a, um, a film critic who said, what this understood me is like the cruelty of the way the Jehovah's Witnesses uses, sh- you know, 
It's not that they inflict active cruelty upon people. It's the cruelty of withdrawing love and support at the time where it is most needed. Yeah. And that was the cruelty. It's like it's not like they're kind of, you know, getting knives and stabbing Louisa. It's that, that Louisa, absolutely, at the point where she most needs the love and support of her family, her family is basically ordered to withdraw that love and support. And that's, yeah, that's a cruelty that is... Um, is in another league. It's like, it's, 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 and again, it's the kind of thing that the Jehovah's Witnesses organization cloaks as a thing of love. And you do see them. They, the elders repeatedly try and get indeed Ivana repeatedly says, we're doing this because we love you. We want to bring you back. And because it's, it's been cloaked, it's basically like an iron fist cloaked in a velvet glove. And the really tragic thing is you can tell that Ivana believes it. And the elders, I mean, at the very minimum, Stephen probably believes it as well, the younger elder, that this is a genuinely the loving thing to do. And I think that's important to bear in mind is that when Jehovah's Witnesses shun loved ones, they're often not doing it to be cruel. They're doing it because they genuinely love that person and they don't want them to be destroyed at Armageddon. And that's, I, I think it was a brilliant portrayal. Again, it, it accurately portrayed how shunning works without demonizing the JWs because it would have been very easy to have all these kind of evil JW creatures, you know, uh, characters cackling over how they were shunning somebody or being indifferent. But they actually showed, you know, the reason that Ivana and even Stephen, the elder, are doing this is because they love Louisa and they don't want her to be destroyed at Armageddon. And that's actually what's going on in the heads of most JWs when they carry out shunning. They're actually putting themselves through hell because Ivana's clearly going through hell. She sees it as the only way to save Louisa. So... Yeah, absolutely. And <clears throat> again, it comes back to the fact that this film is totally non-judgmental. Of, mm. and, 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 you know, it's a wonderful portrayal um, of Ivana that you can see that she desperately wants to help her daughter, that she bent, she's trying to bend the rules as far as she possibly can. Yeah. You know, at one point she takes some food around to her. It's at the time when um, Louisa says, you know, the midwife says the baby's not growing. And mm. her, 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 her motherly instincts immediately kick in. Right, well, I've brought you some, I'm going to make you something healthy. Yeah. But then, and you think, oh, oh, this is, oh, she's, she's actually, you know, she's, she's sort of starting to act as a, as a mother would naturally in this situation. She brings Louisa the food and then she says, I'll eat in the kitchen. And there's oh, this, there's this, yeah. there's this moment in the film yeah. where Louisa, you know, eight or nine months pregnant, uh, scared, alone, ill, frightened for herself, frightened for her unborn child, is sat in the front room eating, and Ivana is sat in the kitchen uh, uh, eating a dinner as well. So because obviously not supposed to eat or socialise with with a, a shunned person or just fellowship person, and yet there is a moment there when Ivana's eating in the kitchen and you see her turn and look and for a split second you think she might go in because um louise is crying and she can hear louise are crying and for a split moment you think go 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 and sit with your daughter and yet she doesn't she stays in the kitchen and she continues eating and that heartbreak you know at, at the end of the day any normal person looking at it now from the outside is like well what on earth is going on there? And yet you don't feel judgmental towards Ivana. You just think she is trapped in this horrendous situation, trapped between love and, and, and motherly affection for her daughter, and yet constrained by these rules being enforced on her by an organisation, you know, which is then personified by these three elders yeah. that are making, that, that are forcing her to act in this way and, and her indoctrination forcing her to act in this way. Speaking of elders, one of the things I'd like to actually focus on now in spoilers is the character of Stephen, because I think he was very well observed, because he illustrates the dichotomy that the elders, at one minute, they will be potential boyfriends or sons or husbands or fathers. And then the next minute, they have to become spiritual policemen. They will become enforcers and regulators and uh, judge and jury. Um, and the path we see Stephen at, first of all, we meet this kind of young, gawky guy who looks like, he, he, looks like he, he should be asking you if you want fries with that at McDonald's. And he, he, oh, then he expresses an interest in getting to know Alex. And I, I want to come on to JW Court later because that's something which I, I actually thought was quite lighthearted. And we, we, might, we might finish the episode on a bit of lighthearted discussion of the JW Courtship stuff. Um, but we see him we see him start to court Alex. So he's this kind of young, sweet guy. And he's obviously nervous around her and he doesn't really know how to 
how to you know be how to how to really you know date someone and he's he's very sweet and endearing and then then he's kind of also um after alex dies he's obviously supporting ivana and he's worried about and you can tell that ivana and steven are kind of looking after each other a little bit emotionally but then because he's an elder with what starts to happen to with louisa steven starts to become an enforcer so he's suddenly telling her he can't she can't associate with her daughter or there could be consequences he's um although he is not as cruel and unkind as the other elders or as unfeeling he's still backing the corporate policy on this he's still he's not dissenting he's clearly going as far as he can to try and encourage louisa to make what he considers the right decision but he's still going to back the um the company play as it were and i thought that was a wonderful illustration of showing how elders this is the weird situation that you're in if you're a jehovah's witness that elder might be your father or your friend or your husband or your son-in-law. But then if you say the wrong thing or you do the wrong thing in their presence or even elsewhere and you get reported on, that person potentially might be your, the judge and jury at your religious trial that takes away all of you know, your, your family association. Um, and it's this weird thing, I think, that a lot of people outside of the Jehovah's Witnesses don't understand how that almost Orwellian level of control and, and policing happens inside the community. What, I mean, what did you think of the way Stephen's arc was portrayed? I mean, yeah, like you say, you know, he's, he's initially introduced as this kind of eager, um, eager young guy. You know, he, he turns up at the door um, shortly after he's been introduced and is clearly, you know, trying to, to get to know Alex. Um, and you see that sort of side of him and like you say he's a bit awkward and he doesn't really know how to approach it but then it's almost like he can he can switch into elder mode um, mm. and he and he parrots back so you know one of the one of the moments in the film which was just absolutely classic for me which was when they were sat in the pub and Ivana's talking to Stephen about uh, Louisa and about you know potential reinstatement and she mm. asked the question well you know what's what's going wrong what's taking so long and Stephen's answer is she likes to voice her opinions too much. Yeah. And, 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 and what was really, you know, the, the, the moment in the film was incredible because then the, the, the camera flips back to Ivana and there's, there's a flicker on her face. Mm. You know, now, uh, looking at it now, you know, any, anybody, any XJW and anyone in the world would turn around and, and, you know, have something to say about that comment. How, you know, well, what's, what on earth's wrong with that? She likes to voice her opinions. Of course she's allowed to voice her opinions. But there's a flicker in Ivana's face and then she lets it go. Yeah. And like you say, it, it's, Stephen can immediately flip from being um, a friend, a, a confidant, a, a boyfriend, whatever, to he's always going to spike the party line. Um, yeah. And the party line is basically... It doesn't matter about Louisa's opinions. She has to do as she's told. And if she doesn't get in line, if she doesn't march in the right way, if she doesn't jump when we say jump, then that means that she's not fully repentant and therefore she's not getting back in. Yeah. And it was very, and in a way, I think uh, it portrays, I mean, I think the primary, the primary sympathies of the film are obviously with the Ivana and Louisa and Alex, but I actually view, I think the film's very sympathetic to Stephen as well and actually portrays him as much of a victim because he's clearly this sweet guy who's just, you know, in any other, in any other world, he'd be like, you know, him and Alex would have got together and he'd be very nice. And it, but it's because the religion has thrust them into this, into this role that he's clearly deep down, you know, the guy wants to help. He doesn't want to be this religious enforcer because he has to be and because he believes in the doctrines. And that's the key thing here is all of the characters apart from Louisa, from what I can tell, believe the doctrines. They're sincere, which means that Stephen becomes the one of the people who's actually, you know, immiserating the situation. He's making things worse. He's warning a mother not to see her her daughter and her grandchild. Um, and, it, and, it, and again, it's an, and it, I think that what the film does very well is it shows how religious fundamentalism and the unquestioning application of doctrines and policies without regards to humanity can, can end up with like ordinary people doing horrible things, not because they want to be cruel or evil, but because they honestly think that's the right thing to do. And to be honest, if you pull back the lens a little, you can see examples all throughout history where ordinary people have done 
bad things and, and painful things and hurtful things because they honestly thought it was the right thing to do. So on one level, this film is very much about the Jehovah's Witnesses, but I think it's also got some very universal themes about the dangers of what happens when we let go of our humanity. And then when we, we you know, if we are deluded enough into following an ideology or an idea off a cliff without pulling back and keeping in contact with our own humanity, where it can lead us. Um, and so in a way, I think, I think Stephen's quite a, in some ways I find him quite a sympathetic character because I can see him being pulled two ways. It's interesting, isn't it? Because I know that you, you've said that about Stephen. I, I find him less sympathetic, um, mm. partly because, you know, I, I think he genuinely cared about Ivana and he obviously cared about Alex and I think he genuinely cares about Louisa and the situation and he wanted you know Louisa to, to come back in but then if you think about it as well that he is also the one that gives that talk from the platform mm. he's also the one that turns the screw on Ivana mm. and I, I, I maybe I'm less sympathetic towards him because as we all know there is essentially there's a career path that's available for, for men within the organization. And one of them, obviously, you know, when you get to be an elder, and he is clearly young to be an elder, you know, he's a young elder. He introduces himself, hello, I'm Stephen, I'm a new elder here. Mm. Um, and so I almost feel like he, he, although he's sympathetic to the situation and he genuinely wants to help, he has completely bought into the doctrine that basically his word and what he mm. thinks and what he says is more important than Ivana's feelings, Louisa's feelings. And then there is that moment where he gives that talk, which is directed directly at Ivana. You know, it's essentially yeah. a marking talk almost. You and know, it's a real right. talk. Well. And, it is a, and it is a real talk as well. And that is straight at her. Um, and so I, I suppose I, I, can, I can hear what you're saying, but, you know, that, that he, he genuinely does try to help. But I don't find him as sympathetic because it's almost like he goes through this arc as well. He's genuinely trying to help. And then, fun, then eventually he gets up on the platform and he gives this talk that is just, you know, a, a mm. horrible um, uh, indictment almost of Ivana trying to help her pregnant daughter. And it's almost like on the one hand, he's trying to be her friend and trying to support her. And then he publicly... Uh, 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 berates her in the mm. Kingdom Hall in front of everyone else. So it, it, that that was what I what I kind of got from 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 Stephen's art almost. And that interestingly enough, that leads on to I, I, what I think is one of the most memorable scenes where Ivana sort of she runs out of the the main auditorium because she can't take it. She runs into the toilet, and because they've got the speaker in there, the, she's still hearing the talk. She can't get away from it, and the camera focuses on that and actually repeats because Stephen repeats a bit of the talk where it was something like if Jehovah holds, if I hold this book up, and it's a red book he's holding up, and Jehovah says this this book is green. Well, I'll say it's green or something like that, which is the, so Orwellian. It's and Jehovah's Witnesses are often described as being Orwellian. Um, and for those who aren't familiar, the work of George Orwell, he wrote um, some dystopian political fiction which warned about this kind of behavior, which is like it doesn't, you know, you will do what we tell you to do. And, you know, we, we want so much control over your thoughts that if we point to something which is blatantly red and tell you it's green, you have to acknowledge that it's green. And not only have you must you acknowledge that it's green, you must believe it's green. Um, or you're not acceptable. Um, and this is what da Daniel brought up in his Q&A, was that this was one of the Orwellian factors that a lot of people don't realise exists with Jehovah's Witnesses. And also, like, there's that, that famous quote now, which you see doing the rounds, um, which came from directly from the governing body, um, which was talking about, you know, that there'll be times when um, if the organisation gives us an instruction, it may not seem sensible from a human standpoint, and yet we must follow whatever instructions we're given. And this yeah. is kind of linking into that because the organization is essentially giving instructions that don't make sense. And yet they are expecting that the rank and file follow those instructions, regardless of how it feels, regardless of the effect that it has on them, because they've been told to do so. And then Stephen and the other elders are the enforcers yeah. of those instructions. There's a movie which I love called Equilibrium, um, which 
I saw when I was at JW. And even then, it had some weird resonances for me. Guys, if you haven't seen it, check it out. Because hey, if you're an ex-JW, you'll be like, holy crap, this is actually, I can see why this would like make a, a JW feel a bit uncomfortable. But also because it's got Christian Bale in it, jumping around doing all sorts of cool martial arts and stuff. So it's a really good movie. Um, but there's a line in there, it's set in a dystopian future where people are completely controlled. And at one point, Christian Bale is, com- he's like this, this, kind of badass enforcer but he's having doubts about what he's doing and he's talking to his boss expressing doubts and saying that my instructions don't make sense you know what you want me to do doesn't make sense and he gets the reply that is like um i think verbatim is something like cleric what you must realize is that whilst you and even i may not always agree with father's direction it is not the message that it is important but our obedience to it and that was like such a, as a JW sat there, I was like, ooh, I feel a bit uncomfortable and I don't know yeah. why. And it <laughs> reminded me, of, um, and seeing it now when you have, you know, everything you just said with, with, with the governing body, when they're saying, it doesn't matter what we say, it doesn't matter if it makes sense. The important thing is you do what we say. Um, this film really, and again, does it in a very subtle way. It's not like flashing and dancing it all over the screen, but it, in a very subtle way shows you how the Jehovah's Witnesses are completely they are required to completely follow any order without question, no matter how crazy it might be. Um, and then one of one of the other, you know, if we're just thinking about the general themes of the um, of the organi- of the of the film, um, something that is portrayed really well. We spoke about this a little bit, you know, pre spoiler, but something that's portrayed really well is how women are treated uh, and viewed in the. Uh, in the organization. And again, it wasn't done in a flashy way. In some ways, I think there could have been more um, about that. But, you know, it fit really well with the story. So that's not in any way a criticism of the story because it it was it was subtly woven through the entire film. Mm. Um, the fact that, um, uh, you know, that there's that comment about Louisa likes to voice her own opinions too much. Yeah. Um, the fact that it's three elders who are men who are judging Louisa. The fact that when Ivana raises, you know, concerns and questions, she's essentially dismissed. You know, everything that she has to say is essentially dismissed. Um, The way that we see that it's always men on the the platform giving the talks. Um, All of these things just feed into this ongoing narrative that women's place in the organization is lesser. Um, Their views don't count, their opinions don't count, their thoughts don't count. It's always subjective to or subjected to, um, you know, what what the men think and what the men feel. And there was a real sense of powerlessness in there. Mm. You know, there's a moment when Louisa is sat in, Louisa's just run out of the... um, uh, the meeting that she was having with the elders, you know, the reinstatement meeting that yeah. she was trying to have. She sat in her car and she's talking to her mother. And she says to them, she says to her mother, do you think it's right the way they make you treat me? Mm-hmm. You know, and, and she says, the elders have got it in for me. And the complete sense of powerlessness that these two women who are essentially jumping and dancing to the tune of the elders. They're trying to do whatever it is they're told, and it's still not good enough. And then later, Ivana is, you know, desperately trying to say, what else needs to happen? What else is being, you know, what Mm. can we do to get Louisa back? Because she desperately wants that relationship with her daughter. And they are powerless in the face of these three men that hold complete control over their lives. Not just their lives in the truth, not just what happens when they go to the Kingdom Hall, but their entire life is Mm. dictated to them by these men. And the really frightening thing and the really real thing is that Ivana doesn't even realize it. Louisa is obviously coming to realize it. Louisa has got to that point where you know, she, she is railing against this organization. She doesn't specifically talk about the inequality of men versus women, but you can see that, you know, she's getting to that point of thinking, you know, why mm. is it that these three men, she says in the, the judicial committee, uh, you're not the policeman of my life. Yeah. And yet Ivana just accepts it because she doesn't know any other way to be. And that for me was really heartbreaking. She was so indoctrinated that she didn't even... You know, as I say, there was that one moment when Stephen says to her, she likes to voice her opinions and there's a flicker on her face. But you can see it was almost like something tried tried to come up in her brain and it was immediately pushed aside Mm -hmm. because in her mind, well, no, of course, Louise is only a woman. Therefore, she shouldn't be voicing her own opinions. Mm -hmm. And the fact that there was no railing against it, there was no, you know, it wasn't 
um, uh, actively and overtly brought up, in some ways actually is very, very clever because it's not even something they're aware of. They just accept it. And, mm. you know, for many JWs and, you know, speaking for myself, for many, many years, well, actually, no, that's not true. I never quite accepted it. It never very, it never sat very well with me. <laughs> but there are so many women who don't actually know that it can be any other way. Yeah. And I think that's one of the, I mean, Sasha Parkinson is the, uh, the actor who plays Louisa and uh, as, as the kind of the waking up JW and they're very clever and they never tell you that she's fully, they never imply that she's completely rejected all the beliefs. Um, but they make it clear that she is aware of, of some mistakes that religions made with 1975 with the blood thing that she's, she's obviously aware that there are issues and she does this great, you, you see her change from being someone who is, starting to realize there's more to life than being a Jehovah's Witness. And then the kind of the anguish where she's aware of the ridiculous situation where her mother is avoiding her because these three men are telling her. Um, and, and she does, I think the contrast, especially in some of the scenes between Ivana, who is desperately trying to hold on to her emotional control, and Louisa, who is aware of the situation that's going on and clearly is in some ways is much more emotional, but also much more clear headed and seeing the situation far more clearly. Those are scenes that are absolutely towards the end of the film are just gripping. Um, mm. And I, I think again, it's everyone involved is making, you know, the directors and the actors are all making these very clever, very, very wise choices that, that are kind of like, well, if, if in this scene we could either do this dancing around and making a huge issue, or we could do this very subtly and very powerfully, they always seem to opt for the subtle, powerful performances. Mm. Um, and yeah, it just kind of, it's absolutely gripping to watch. And what's really interesting, so right at the end of the film, um, when uh, Ivana meets her granddaughter for the first time and Ivana starts saying, well, you know, I'll pick her up from nursery and I'll take her to the meetings. And mm. at that moment, it's almost like Louisa finally gets, she, Louisa goes through this arc where she is disfellowshipped. She's trying to jump the hoops to get back in. And then mm. all of a sudden she has a realisation. It's almost like the blinkers finally lift and she finally becomes clear headed. And she is absolutely clear about the fact that she is not doing, she says, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not jumping these hoops anymore. And then she mm -hmm. also says, my daughter is having nothing to do with any of this. But then mm -hmm. she also says to her mother, we'll be here. We yep. will be here if you want to come and engage with us. And in some ways you, you finally see that Louisa Sudden, in that moment is actually the parent. She becomes yeah. the, 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 the person who is, is, is putting down her boundaries and saying, I am not jumping these hoops and I am not forcing my daughter to go through these hoops, but we're here if you want to come and interact with us. And that kind of contrast between then, and then that's the moment when Ivana has this, this, this moment of madness and, and tries to, to take mm -hmm. um, the, her granddaughter out of the house. And that contrast between those two characters, where Louisa initially was the daughter, um, you know, she was uh, being, you know, uh, parented by Ivana. And then all of a sudden the tables have turned. Louisa is now a parent. Louisa now finally gets it. Um, mm. There's a heartbreaking moment where she says to her mother, I can't believe that you just sat there and watched Alex die. And she's looking yep. at her own daughter. And she finally has that realization of what it means to be a mother and what that unconditional love should look like. And yet she still says to her mother, I will be here. We will be here if you want to come and engage with us. Mm -hmm. And that strength, I think, from Louisa, you know, that strength that she had in that moment is stronger than all the other stuff that had happened throughout the film. Um, because that was the pure strength that we saw there of, of, of coming to a realisation, being a mother and setting those boundaries for her life and for her daughter. And I thought it was, it was you know, one of the, I mean, it was the culmination of the film anyway, but it was absolutely a gripping scene. Yeah. And I think it's very well observed because one thing I've noticed from like hearing so many former Jehovah's Witnesses tell that story Having children seems to be a crunch point for some of them where they decide, I can't allow my child to be in this. They were almost like I, they were thinking about going back or they were thinking about leaving, but having a child suddenly became a driving issue. It's almost like I, I can tolerate this, but I'm not going to put my child through this. And you'll yeah. hear that that's either when they fully woke up or when they fully took the decision to disfellowship or when they took a decision to 
you know, they, 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 whatever it was, and there, there are many variations of this story. So it's, it's, you can't do a sweeping generalization. But for many former Jehovah's Witnesses, it does seem to be that there was a moment of there was a there was a moment when they suddenly realised if they stay, this was going to start impacting their child, and then it's almost like the, <laughs> for want of a better word, the kind of the mama bear instinct kicks in, um, and and then and then they, that kind of you know puts them into action. And you can see, as you say, with Louisa, it's like when she says, "My child's not going to be involved with this." It's very clear that you know Louise, because Louise has seen what it's done to Alex. She's seen what it's doing to her mother. She's seen what it's doing to herself. She's seen the way the elders have treated her and handled this situation. And you know the thought that her child might go through that as well. It's almost you, it's almost like a Sarah Connor moment. <laughs> it's it's just you know that that is not happening. And yeah. so it's yeah, like you say, it's 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 an incredibly powerful final scene. And it's I, I like the way that it, it does end. It is. It, it, is an un, it is kind of unresolved and it is tragic because as far as we know, Ivana's staying and Louise is leaving and Alex has died. But I appreciate that because that's the reality for many Jehovah's Witnesses and XJWs. It doesn't all end with a happy ending and a bow and everyone wakes up and leaves happily ever after. It often ends in... But what, what's the say? Nothing ever really ends. It's just this is the situation we leave those characters in and we don't know where they're going to go from now, but that's, that's where we all are. And that's where Jehovah's Witnesses are. And I think that's a very, that's a very, a very powerful way to end that particular film. Yeah, I agree. So one thing I'd like to discuss now, and I'm going to turn things back to a slightly lighter topic, although it still might involve lots of me shouting at the microphone, is Jehovah's Witness courtship. Chaperone time, people. Oh, yeah. I loved the way they portrayed JW courtship in this movie. It is apt, a, it's spot on. And, and again, I think this won't have been everyone's experience because depending on where you are in the world and what your congregation is and also how old you are, you can actually, you will have different experiences. But the basic way they portray it here is a lot of JWs will go through this where Stephen it's not like he can just say to Alex, hey, do you want to go get a drink? Um, and they can just go get a drink and get to know each other. It's like he talks to the mother and the, so I'd like to get to know you. Would you like a glass of water? Um, he sort of sits down there all awkward and the mother's through in the other room, leaving the door open so that immorality can't happen, you know, over mm, a glass. Yep. And, and then they're doing everything together. So they're like on that balcony and Ivana's like cleaning up the house, which I thought was actually really sweet. And that's like what, you know, because she wants to help, and she's clearly excited that this this elder's interested in Alex. And Alex, Alex does genuinely seem to be interested in in Stephen. Or maybe I maybe I didn't quite get that because I thought at first, oh, is this going to be something that Alex doesn't want? But she does seem to be quite at least interested in him. Um, I don't yeah, know. I mean, maybe that's something. Maybe what was your take on that? Well, I, it's one of those things where um, Alex. I mean, Alex is eighteen years old. And mm. it's something that, you know, lots of people, certainly from my own experience and also anecdotally, uh, JWs tend to get married very young. Yep. Um, you know, they, 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 because apart from anything, it's the only way you can have a proper relationship is to, you know, it's the only way you can, you know, go on holiday together and live together and, mm. you know, have uh, <gasps> sexual relations and all that sort of stuff. And so it is, it is something that a lot of the time younger particularly younger women young girls do tend to get married quite young mm. we don't know how old Stephen is but he's obviously he's an elder so he's obviously of a certain age so this, he must yeah, be this was my confusion because the one thing i thought is that if he's an elder he should really be in his early 30s but he he looked to be in his early 20s and i, I think he was that actor robert ems may just have that look to him i don't know I, I, I get the feeling that he's supposed to be early 30s. I mean, that that yeah. kind of felt... I, I think he was a very young-looking early 30s, but I think he's early 30s. And this is also something else that you, you do sometimes see in the organisation, much older brothers, um, you know, yeah. being interested in much younger sisters. Coming back to your, your point about whether Alex was, you know, whether she was interested in this, I think she was, but I'm not sure her motivations for doing so, because... There is, you know, there's this hierarchy within an organization. Mm. And I think on the one hand, she found it flattering that an elder was interested in her. And also, when you're, when you're a young, when you're growing up as a young woman in the organization, your options are very few. You don't actually have many options for your life ahead of you. The main thing that you're supposed to do is get married, have kids, pioneer, 
you know, raise your children um, and, you know, become an elder's wife. You know, that's the sort of that's the um, the, the, the path for, for most women. And so I'm not sure whether, you know, if you put 10 guys in front of Alex and said, which one do you fancy? Mm. I'm not sure she would have gone for Stephen, put it that way. So I don't think, I think although, you know, he was obviously nice to her and, you know, they smiled together and they obviously had a, you know, a, a, a nice relationship between the two of them. You didn't feel that there was any kind of passion or excitement from Alex's side about him as an individual. I got the feeling it was more him, the elder, the status, um, you know, and also the fact of, you know, when you're 18 years old, obviously you want a boyfriend, you know, that's something that, that young mm. girls want. And so that was kind of presented to her. And I suppose there's also the, op- there's the possibility this might be the first guy who's ever expressed an interest in her. Because one of the things, and I will one day do a podcast screaming about the way that JW's handled dating, because it was one of the biggest frustrations of my life when I was in. Um, but she, he might be, because JW's, it's such a big thing to someone ask someone out on a date. And they show that very good. The, the poor guy's only just shown interest in the talk about now marriage is a serious commitment. Yeah. You know, and it, it's ridiculous. Which means that most JWs, when they're that young, they're terrified of expressing interest in anyone. So poor old Alex, this might be the first time anyone's ever actually come up to her and kind of expressed interest. So there's probably also, I wonder if there's an element of that going on with that character, where whereas most normal 18-year-old girls would have had probably a load of boyfriends. And I I think they make a good choice to play. They play Alex as if she's slightly younger than 18, which many JW kids are. They they are are slower developing. So Alex almost has this kind of like, oh, this is, from what I got from the performance, there was an element of this has never happened to me before. And because she was worried about the blood thing, she brings it up to say, you wouldn't want me because of this blood thing. And then he still clearly says, oh, no, I do. And so I think that she's always had this fear that no one would want her because of the transfusion. And when he clearly is still interested, my impression is that that kind of like, that's quite touching to her. So I'm, and I'm not, this is not to dismiss anything you say. I, th- I think you're probably right in the way you've sussed it. And I think it's another example of how like complex and nuanced the portrayals and the writing is because I think all of these factors are in her head. Um, but it kind of like the, the way they just portray the JW dating with the courtship, like the way when they're on the balcony and they have that first little kiss, but, uh, but, but Stephen has to like look carefully to see if, uh, if Anna's looking. And then when he sees she's not looking, he goes in for that like very kind of, you know, on the lips, very close, very, mouth, chaste. Um, very, <laughs> very chaste kiss. No heavy petting allowed like, here. <laughs> no, no heavy petting on the balcony. Um, it, it struck me as, I mean, I, I, without going into details of my own life, I, I have experiences of JW courtship and the bad ones were like that. I don't know what your experiences were, Alice, but that struck a, um, an opinion for me. Yeah, I, I think a lot of what you've just said also, you know, about this, the feeling flattered that somebody's interested in her and, you know, and also, you know, she wants to be romanced. She wants to go on dates. She wants to, you know, sit in the Kingdom Hall holding hands with somebody, partly because she's 18 years old and, you know, that's what girls do, what guys as well, not just specifically girls, but also because that's the kind of path that's set out for her. And so, you know, the next step for her is to meet someone and then to get married and then to do all of those things. And there is sort of like a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I suppose from, from my own experience, there is almost like a kudos of being, mm. of, of dating, of, of, of dating someone, you know, that it's like, oh, so-and-so is dating so-and-so. And, and then, every, you know, it's something interesting. And then bearing in mind, in mind that, you know, the average JW life is actually, when you look at it, rather dull you know go to a meeting go on the ministry go to work but you're not really allowed to put anything into work come home do some studying you know that excitement is probably the first proper bit of excitement that she's had in her life oh someone's interested in me someone you know wants to to court me and it's the use of the word courting as well that made me laugh (laughs) because it's like you don't date in the jw's you court you step out with somebody um and that that you know it, it, it's essentially like trying to date in the 1950s or something um yeah. but yeah that, that you know alex i think a very sweet sweet character very naive you know mm. and like you say because when you when you grow up in the jw world you are insulated and protected and naive and vulnerable you, are, so you, you, are, say, you develop slower so the 18 yeah. year olds are more like 15 year olds yeah. and the 20 year olds are more like yeah yeah and now all of a sudden this older man who's an elder is showing an interest in her and wants to hold her hand and wants to kiss her 
And of course, she's going to go along with that. You know, it, it doesn't mean that she's desperately in love with him, I don't think. Or, you know, you never sort of got from her that she, re- you know, mm-hmm. she really fancied him or, or she really wanted to, um, you know, to, 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 to go out with him. It was just that that was what was presented in front of her. Her options were very few. I'm not saying that she didn't like it because she clearly did, but it's not, you could see that there was no passion there. There was no um, desperate attraction there, certainly not from her side, I don't think. Uh, And another very subtle point to make on the the theme you brought up about how women are treated, uh, it became very obvious that he wants to be a circuit overseer. So if she married him, she was basically going to be a circuit overseer's wife. And that's what she was going to be. I mean, her options, Alex's options would be fairly, you can't really, if your husband's a circuit overseer, you can't, you know, go off and be um, anything else really. And you basically have to go around with him and be a circuit overseer's wife. So, and again, it, it, it probably, it, it's the kind of thing that if you're aware of the way Jehovah's Witnesses operate, you could see that if Alex, you know, had married him and had, hadn't died, she would have been locked into that life. Um, essentially whatever he wanted to go off and do, she would have been just kind of following him, cooking meals for him uh, and cleaning his clothes. And any ambitions she would have had um, would have been very much subservient to that. Um, and he, oh, I've just, I've just looked up. So Robert Ems, he was born in 1986. So I think clearly, yeah, the, the character of... That makes the character him is, 32. 32. So that does fit, doesn't it? So that's the... He probably has been an elder. You get the impression he's a new elder, so elder for a couple of years. So there's, yeah. So that that does fit, as you say. That's not uncommon in the Jehovah's Witnesses to see a girl in her late teens and a guy in his early thirties. Um, yeah, that, that's that's another very well. Well, he's going to age well, Robert Ems. He looked younger. He looked in his early twenties. Uh-huh. So <laughs> well done, but sir. The, you know, the, yeah. The, the, you know that, and that's that's something that you know. If you speak to to many many XJW women. Um, and there are some incredible uh, female activists. And, and one of the common themes is that um, we all essentially, or, or a lot of us, felt like our life was decided for us when we were very, very young, because the only that, that it was like the path was set out in front of us. This is what you're expected to do. You are a complement. You are a helper to the men. And therefore, the men decide, and whatever they decide, we support and we help and we complement. Um, and you know, as as our, our listeners will have gathered by now, um, certainly speaking for myself, that was something that never sat comfortably. And for most XJW women who then come out of the, the religion, um, that's one of the first things that goes. It's it's essentially, you know, I'm my own individual. I have my own plans and my own dreams for my own life. I'm not just here to compliment and help my man whatever he wants to do um but that you know it wasn't it you know it wasn't like a major part of the film we saw mm. that sort of initial and we don't you know we, we we're not really aware of time scales as such but it all it's all kind of happening within this kind of nine month mm. period essentially yeah. um from you know louisa getting pregnant and then towards the end she's obviously had the baby um so we don't know, you know, how long they were going out. So it wasn't a massive part of the film, but it did. It was just another very nice element that added to the authenticity of the whole thing um, that I could certainly relate to. You know, thinking back to to when I was eighteen years old and in the in the JW world and what was expected of me, um, you know, and, and and how dating and courtship was approached. I think that brings us to an end of our spoiler discussion. It's, there's probably more we could think of, but it's the kind of film that I think I'm definitely going to watch again and will probably observe a lot more on a second and a third watching because it's, it's a very subtle, very nuanced film, and I, I'm definitely going to watch it um, multiple times. Um, so just summing up, I mean, Alice, what were your opinions of the movie um, as an XJW and as a film fan? Um, I mean, a lot of what we've already said, I think, uh, you know, I think the f- first and foremost, this is an incredible piece of filmmaking. Um, regardless of XJW, you know, my feelings from that point of view, as a standalone film, it is an incredible piece of piece of work. Um, the uh, direction is fantastic. The writing is amazing. And the acting is just as I say, some of these performances, I think, were the, the best, the three central characters, um, mm. particularly the character of Ivana, you know, the, the, the acting 
the 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 um the display of that you know the the, the portrayal of that character arc and seeing the emotions and the conflict um some of the best you know one of the best performances i've seen in a very long time um from an xjw point of view it was heartbreaking mm. it was um difficult to watch at times um partly because as i say it took me back to times that i haven't thought about for a long time and i've been insulating myself um not perhaps in the last couple of years but certainly for a long time i insulated myself from all of that and being transported back into that world and feeling the feelings again was mm. hard work and it was draining emotionally draining um but ultimately i'm just you know i'm absolutely blown away incredibly impressed and also very grateful to daniel for bringing this piece of work and for doing it so well and doing so much justice to the story but also doing it with so much empathy and so much authenticity um so it, it's it's a fantastic fantastic film yeah i i would echo that i think it's a very powerful film in its own right and it 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 portrays I view it very much as like, um, I think Daniel brought this on his Q&A, it's almost like a soft entrance point for people. Mm. So it's not for JWs, it's not going to hit them over the head with all of the, all of the, you know, the contents of JW facts made into a film. It's a very soft entrance for them, but also for the general public to just kind of ease themselves into the life of what a Jeho- you know, what the life of a JW is. Um, so I'm, I'm a huge fan of the film and I'm really excited to see where, uh, you know, direct Daniel goes next with his career because I think um, I know people were asking if you wanted to do more JW work. I think I, I'd be overjoyed if he wants to explore the Jehovah's Witnesses further in his film career. But I'd also be really interested to see what other stories he's got to tell. I'm I'm really interested in seeing where his career goes next. Yeah, definitely one to watch. So that brings us to the end of our apostasy discussion, uh, both of spoilers and non-spoilers. Just want to give a, a huge thank you to uh, Alice Cheshire for joining me on this podcast uh, and also to uh, Daniel Cockatilo and also the, all of the cast and crew um, of Apostasy for all of the, the time and the hard work and the creative energies they put into, into making that film. It's, I think it's, it's a wonderful film in its own right and it's also very kind of cathartic and very vindicating for former Jehovah's Witnesses to see and it's very useful I think for, for the general public to kind of see and to help them really empathise uh, and understand with um, a community that they probably don't know much about and haven't really seen the inner workings of before. So I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Um, if you have enjoyed it, there's many ways you can support the show. Uh, you can leave us a review uh, on whatever uh, podcast application you listen to us through, be it iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube or Podbean or many of the others. You can share us on social media and you can share us with your family and friends. If you'd like to support us financially, you can do so on Patreon. Uh, you can start from uh, $1 a month and in exchange for that, you get access to all sorts of cool extras as our way of saying thank you to you you can also check us out on youtube Uh, we have a youtube channel which is covert fade Um, all of the forwardcast episodes are going up there but we also are going to start putting some funky little extras up there as well uh, whenever we get the time to do so so give us a subscribe on youtube that's uh, covert fade on youtube so thank you again for listening and i'd just like to end by saying remember you only get one life So work out the kind of life you want to live, put a plan into action, and start living it now.